From Tobacco Republic in Loomis, California, the Loomis Cigar Cartel presents Beyond the Humidor, a cigar podcast for the rest of us. Holy crap, it feels like freedom right now. Scott Robinson with you on the latest edition of Beyond the Humidor. If you're looking at this on video, we don't have a whole bunch of mic stands surrounding us. Or cables. Or cables, or you know, general crap. This is freaking terrific, man. Greg and I, um, last weekend, he had purchased um, some wireless mics and these seem to work and we managed to break the code so we've got mics that sound good but we can actually sit about and you know it just takes it to another level for me the next step you know is no headphones yeah but at least an earpiece that's what i'm thinking yeah. even if it's a wired earpiece mm -hmm. yeah no, this this is uh this is off the hook man i've got mine clipped up to my hat right here uh sound is fantastic uh, yeah this is we're at a whole new level. I'm yeah, excited, we are. gentlemen. Yes, I love it, I love it, I love it. How are you guys doing um, over this past week? Hanging in there. It's, uh, it's, been, a, uh, it's been a busy week, but uh, eh, nice to relax and sit around with you guys, smoke, and talk about life. Yeah. It's been interesting. You know, we've had, uh, we'll get to this later, but, you know, the shop's been a buzz with a couple of different conversations. Uh, one of them we're going to touch on a bit, I think. Yeah. And uh, the other, we'll save that for the end of the show. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds but good. But it's been a good week so far. So, you know, uh, I like the, the topic we've got today, at least the, the cigar-related topic, I like a lot because it's something that, that people don't really think about. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Um, let's just jump right into it since, um, you know, obviously we all know what I'm drinking. You know, McAllen and he, these guys are drinking coffee. So let's just take the short trip to Grandma's house. And let's talk about um, cigars in the morning. If you um, love cigars like we do, you know, you're up in the morning and one of your first, well, you know, I wouldn't say first thing in the morning. Second. Yeah, second, third, fourth thing in the morning is to sit back and enjoy a cigar, especially some of us who work from home. So you get set up. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> Stop your whining. Hey, man, I, I go into the shop early. I, I know, my, I know. I own my own business. I smoke in there. Too. Yeah, he can do whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> no. Poor Greg's a drone. He has to work in corporate America. We'll get you one of those little candy cigars you can take. Uh, yeah, yeah. Remember when we were kids and they had the candy cigarettes? Yeah. Those were the greatest thing ever. You can ever. still get those down in Old Sack. Really? Yeah, the candy store down there's got them. Sounds like a road trip, buddy. I like it. You can it. stop there on the way to Lodi. <laughs> <laughs> take a gun. Well, Old Sack ain't that bad. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> it's gotten real bad lately. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, we segued off of that quick. Anyway. Yeah, that was so dark. So morning cigars. <laughs> So let's, and for once, it wasn't you, it was me. <laughs> yeah, see? See, I try to do good. <laughs> wow. Well, you try to do well. Hey, hey, let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, what are you smoking this morning, man? You know what? I'm not smoking just yet. Since this is um, a little, um, little guy, it's an Arroyo um, Prensado. And I figured for a morning cigar, for me... Depending on my type of morning, when I'm inundated with meetings and whatnot, I like to um, have just something small that I don't have to rush through, but just something I can just sit back and enjoy for anywhere from, this is probably about a good, you know, 40-minute cigar if you're taking your time. Mm -hmm. You could probably hot box it in 20, but why would you do that? I, mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, I actually have not smoked this yet. Okay. Um, it's, um, Kristen Arroyo um, out of CLE Tobacco Company. Um, and this is the first one out of the CLE Tobacco Company that he's actually put his name on. And it's a four inch by 48, if I recall correctly. And I picked this up over at Rocky Mountain. I actually picked up a box because I was getting into this thing where I was looking for like small cigars and lunch breaks because there's just, I mean, as of late, you know, as far as my job goes, we're getting towards the end of the year and projects start becoming due so it starts getting real real intense so i'm just living on the phone on conference calls and trying to keep stuff up so i don't have a lot of time to sit back and truly enjoy a cigar for an hour or so just minding email it's actually you know i'm actively doing something but if i can squeeze in some time i can um 
you know, take a little bit of, um, take a little smoke of this. So I'm going to reserve, you know, my review. I'm going to let you guys go through it. I'm going to light this bad boy and see, you know, what we're getting initially. So I'm going to go ahead and defer to you, Greg. Um, what are you smoking this morning? So, you know, as you know, we were, we were all hanging out last night here at the lounge and, uh, found one in there that I hadn't really seen before. And I guess, uh, one of our, our loyal, uh, listener, watcher, Facebook friends, uh, Lemke sent me a message cause I posted this cigar. It's called a Perla Del Mar. Um, I posted that I was trying it out and I guess we also got one in our goodie bags, but I got mine here at Tobacco Republic. It's called the Perla Del Mar shade. It is a, a little teeny guy, as you can see. Um, it's a Ecuadorian Connecticut shade wrapper. I think it's a great morning cigar because it's light. You know, there's a, a, a theory on that, which we'll expand on in a little bit. Um, it's a Nicaraguan binder and a Nicaraguan filler. So it's nice. It has subtle sweet notes, um, more earthy than woodsy. It, it just makes for a good pairing with a cup of coffee. And it's, for me, it's lighter, which is what I prefer in the morning. Okay. Larry, what are you smoking, my friend? Well, this morning I've got a, uh, a Davidoff Signature, the Petit Corona. So it's a little bit smaller cigar, a little lighter. I am a coffee guy in the morning. And that being said, I want a cigar to go with my coffee, not coffee to go with my cigar, if that gotcha. makes sense. Um, what I'm drinking coffee-wise right now is uh, the Mexican um, blend that's uh, processed with honey. It's a yard dog that we've talked about before. Okay. And mm -hmm. a, we're still working out finding a date to get yard dog here on the show with us. But um, I like a nice, st strong cup of coffee in the morning. That's what I've got here. And it pairs well with a lighter cigar. Um, I don't do a lot out of the Davidoff line. But there are a handful of uh, Davidoffs that, that re I really like, number one. And the, the Corona, the Signature, is a light enough cigar, uh, even in this small ring gauge. It's a, it's, I'm getting plenty of draw, yeah. and I'm getting that light flavor that's not overpowering my coffee. So, And it's a smaller stick, like you were talking about. Uh, so it's something you can get through in the morning, 40, 45 minutes. You know, even if you're having to put it down a couple of times to do something, yeah. uh, you can get uh, you can get a nice smoke out of your morning without uh, you know without taking up an hour, hour fifteen, something like right, that. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, I did the same thing up in Denver. Um, I was looking for sm some smaller sticks, um, some lunch break stuff. Uh, we got I got some stuff from Illusion. Oh yeah, uh, and some you know a couple other places, and and was kind of specifically looking at sample packs. If somebody had a sample pack that had some of the their smaller stuff in it, that was kind of where I gravitated to this year, sample pack wise, just because you know same type of thing. We're you know I've got I've got a lot of stuff going on at the shop, and uh, you know I don't smoke throughout the day in in the shop when you know, we're open during regular business hours, but I get in there considerably earlier than when we open. So it's nice to have something that I can actually get through the whole cigar mm -hmm. where I'd found where a lot of my go-to things that are, that are more of a, you know, a 50 or 60 ring gauge, I'm only smoking a little more than halfway through. And then I have to put them down because it's time to, you know, turn the lights on, open the door, so to speak. So I can, I was feeling that I was kind of wasting a, you know, well, yeah. a little bit. So I've, I've, I've rounded up some smaller cigars and, uh, some stuff I've, I've had a couple I've tried. I've really, really been happy with a couple and, eh, you know, I may have to, you know, work my way into a little bit or, yeah. you know, change up, have a, a little different, you know, lighter coffee with those or darker or maybe, but, but, uh, yeah, that's what I'm kind of been into here since the, the last couple of months and, yeah. I'm I'm really happy with the signature. It's been a really good cigar this morning. Yeah, exactly. I've been falling into this um, habit as far as size for probably over um, the past year. 
you know, getting something smaller because my concern's always been with a um, longer cigar. If you've got to put it down, it gets kind of stale. And I, you know, if you leave it sitting there even for like half an hour and not taking care of it and not keeping heat through it, the tobacco tends to get a little stale. You yes. start losing taste. So that's why I started gravitating towards the um, smaller lengths. Um, re-engage, I don't care so much about, but just something in shorter length of a four well, inch, perhaps. That, that's what derailed me a little bit when I started looking at these, you know, sm you know, shorter time sticks. I don't want to say smaller because that's not necessarily that, yeah, the right word. Um, at first, I was looking at, you know, the same ring gauge stuff that I'm used to smoking, but in a shorter cigar. So there something, you, you know, Nubs put out some good stuff. But, really? Uh, um, yeah, there's a couple of Nubs in there. We'll, you know, we'll look after the show. Yeah, but, let's uh, talk about that um, because that, that'd actually be, if I was thinking about it and was a more helpful beaver, um, get into the Nubs because I did see a lot of smaller ones, but I've never really gravitated towards that brand. I'm curious as to, you yeah, know. There's a couple in there, I think, if you're doing coffee in the morning, you would, you would really like. Uh, but it's one of those things. It's uh, because it's a larger ring gauge cigar, what I've noticed personally, if I put, have to put that cigar down mm -hmm. and have to relight it, it's a little rough on the relight. The, the larger ring gauges for me, and for whatever reason, maybe it's just personal taste, seem to be a little bit rougher on the relight if they've been sitting in, you know, sitting in the ashtray yeah. for 20, 30 minutes than something like this. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've turned, you know, like I said, in the mornings I've turned to a little bit smaller ring gauge, a little bit shorter cigar, and I'm also, I don't have any, any nubs or any of the, that stuff in my humidor. Another short cigar, and we gotta get up there, and I didn't go by when I was in Reno two weeks ago, uh, Ruiz yeah. makes a uh, uh, 60 by, it's about three and a half is all it is, mm -hmm. um, but it's a fantastic stick. Uh, kind of torpedoed, not, yeah. not a true torpedo at the end, mm -hmm. but it, it's got that, uh, got that kind of bell shape okay. uh, end and really good stick. Uh, it's probably about a 40, 45 minute smoke um, at that bigger ring gauge. Yeah. And if you put a nice straight cut on the end of that, you're mm -hmm. getting a lot of smoke. Um, and it's, it's a really good flavor, really good coffee cigar in the morning. Well, you know what? Since we've kind of broken the code on the wireless thing, and I know I keep harking on this, but um, I'm suspecting two, we've got two factors going on. We found this little bit of technology we've broken the code on, and that the snow's going to be coming within the next couple of months um, at the pass. We need to make a Reno trip over the next few weeks or something yep. and make our way over to one of our favorite places, um, Fumari. Yep. Yeah, I do Fumari and then, <laughs> and then Ruiz. Yeah, Ruiz has got two spots now. Uh, and then uh, uh, right there, it's called the Brewery District. Mm -hmm. uh, they're off of South Virginia in uh, Reno. Battleborn's got their, uh, their place. The old, um, God, I, know, I can never remember the name of it. Uh, it's a combo. They do, uh, they do beers, and there's, they're also the first craft um, spirits mm -hmm. uh, in the state of Nevada. Oh, right uh, on. And then right across the, the street is the old glass shop from the 40s okay. that is brick oven pizza, and then they do craft beers and stuff as well. Really? So uh, there's a mead place a half a block down the same street. So you can park one place and go to like four different, four different little places and, and Three of the four have food, so it's okay. just, it's kind of a, it was kind of a neat experience. Uh, we were up there last year, and we went up for the Rib Fest uh, this year and kind of wandered around, but we didn't get out into town this, this go around, so um, it, uh, Reno's a fun trip, man. It's just, yeah, I always you know, enjoy going, you know, popping through they've there. they cleaned it up uh, a bunch, you know, there's a place up in, uh, Carson City now that uh, we went to a couple years ago. God, it's been already two years right at the beginning of COVID. Oh, wow. Um, so it wasn't last year for Rib Fest. It was the year before. We drove out to Carson City, and it's a full bar uh, with cigars. 
Okay. So that that was kind of a neat experience too. So yeah, we got uh, we got some stuff we got to do on the road for sure. Yeah, yeah. for and, sure. And this this and you know Scott's come back to this a couple times, and so will I. These mics we've tried. Was this the third? This or fourth is the set? third set. Third set, yeah. yeah. And because you know we've we've been actively looking for these, and this is going to be a game changer. Man. Yeah, it this is. is. This is off the hook right now. Yeah, yeah because um, I was I found a. a uh, not that not that you you guys want to know this, but I found a carry case that will the board, the few cables that we need, and the mics, one bag. There we go. So it will make it easy to travel with. I still love how you said that. Not that you guys care, but screw you. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you guys. That's, had that's kind of, of our matter. theme on everything, by the Pretty way. Pretty much. Well, yeah. Let me um, circle back. Ugh, well, God, I, I did I not gotta, say that. Yes, um, you did. I got. I, I I have a question for the two of you because. You two are more Maduro smokers than I am. Yeah. Um, do you find, um, on the topic of morning cigars, there's a theory, smoke light cigars in the morning to heavy cigars in the evening. And I know it, it also depends on one's personal preference of what they like, but, but is, you know, the lighter ones, is that typically all you're sticking with? Um, not necessarily. I, I smoke primarily darker cigars, so I've had to... I've had to do some research and some trial and error mm -hmm. on lighter stuff. Um, and this was, I actually physically this morning had to go through and look for something in a size that I would wanted in something lighter. Cause my go-to would be about half again bigger, excuse me, half again bigger than this and about twice to three times as dark. Yeah. But Again, I'm trying, you know, I, I want the coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, and, and not to say that, you know, there's not Maduro cigars out there that don't pair well with coffee, but I just, lately, for whatever reason, I seem to be going from lighter to darker throughout the course of the day. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going to do something really dark, really heavy, which I don't mind, double, triple Maduro, that you need a meal with. Yeah. Um, whether you're a big guy, little guy, whatever, you not a good idea to do, you know, the double, triple Maduro's yeah. on, an, on an empty stomach or on, you know, not much of a meal. So that's been kind of my tendency where if I'm going to do something heavy at the end of the day, especially on a weekend, I'm going to sit around and smoke a dark, heavy cigar at night. That's when I want to do it is at night after I've eaten, you know, a decent meal. Right. I don't typically eat breakfast in the morning, um, other than when we're doing the show, is honestly probably the only day of the week I have a sit-down meal. Typically, you know, it's either um, uh, an instant, you know, some type of instant breakfast, even if I have that, or I do a granola bar or banana or something, is about the most I ever eat in the morning. So I've found that, you know, if I stay a little bit lighter, on the cigar in the morning, I'm a little bit better off. <laughs> I'm sorry, our live audience is asleep. <laughs> no, I'm just boring the shit out of him. <laughs> there he is nodding his head. There we go, and that's it. So, uh, hey, glad I could do my part, Chris. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's just, you know, I, and, it, and it's funny, we talk about the, you know, this, the, it's kind of an evolution in your smoking. I've been smoking cigars almost 30 years, and I, it's still, I mean, it's its still a process. You're still doing stuff trial and error, well, yeah. you know, because your palate changes. You know, I'm 50 pounds heavier than I was when I started smoking cigars. You know, I'm 30 years older. I got, you know, they're different. I do different shit now than I did when I started. Right. You know, here Chris, who's older than I am. This is Greg's dad sitting over here. Now he's <laughs> laughing. But, because... But it's it's true, you know. You just you go through a, uh, you know, a program, and it that program changes. You yeah, know? that's and the it, truth. I mean, for me, I don't want to say random. It's just what I feel like in the morning, and also depends on the you know what the selection is in my humidor. Um, pre Rocky Mountain, the you were pretty desperate. The cupboards were the cover the cupboards, the cupboards were, were a little bare. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was old Mother Hubbard of the cigar world. I was just looking through and just trying to find anything. 
you know, and I had a lot of Maduros left over, so um, I was smoking a lot of Maduros in the morning, but my preference is something in a lighter to medium in the morning, even yep. after, um, you know, a nice breakfast. I don't really want to, you know, have that as I call it the punch in the face in the morning. Yeah, no, for sure. It, uh, it'll definitely change your attitude if you get, uh, if you get something too, uh, too heavy first thing in the morning. But, uh, yeah, it's funny. I, when I say I pair cigars with coffee, uh, I drink coffee all day, every day. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's 40 degrees or, or you know, 104 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, I drink coffee every day, seven days a week. Just, that's just how I was raised. That's what my dad did. That's what I do. Um, so I can pair just about anything with a coffee yeah. because chances are I'm going to have a coffee sitting around some point right, during the day. Right. But uh, I've, I've spent a little more time and a little more energy into what I want to get in the morning. Do I want... Do I want to get a coffee experience or do I want to get a cigar experience? Right. And some days it's cigar, you know. Yeah. But okay. We'll pull a crisp off, you know. We'll pull a crisp off Maduro out, and then <laughs> that's what we're having this morning. And it doesn't matter what cup of co what I pour in the coffee cup. There's coffee in there, but it's I'm getting crisp off Maduro today. Right. I and hear then, you. You know, like this morning, I said, you know, I wanted to go something with a little bit lighter so I could deal with the, you know, you know get the yard dog. And, uh, yeah, it's just, don't be afraid to try stuff, man. I mean, it's, what's the worst that could happen? You know, you don't like it. You, yeah. You know, hey, okay. Lesson gonna, learned. Yeah, I'm not going to drink any more coffee. I'll finish this cigar and mm -hmm. I'll try something different tomorrow. No big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, coming back to my cigar and uh, let them talk about theirs because I wanted to get a trial and see how this one tastes. I'm liking it very, you know, I'm liking this cigar, obviously. Haven't put it down, but um, it's Honduran wrapper with a um, Colorado Maduro. Doesn't smoke like a Maduro, but I'm getting a woodsy and a little bit of cinnamon out of it. That's funny. That because you say that, I thought I got a little bit of whiff of a of a, a cinnamon, which I don't normally I don't normally get a a, a smell a aroma like that off of a cigar. But I I'm getting that. Off you know of what it. this means, right? We found cinnamon. <laughs> there is way too much explanation for that for this Sorry, program. Sorry, you guys ain't gonna hear. It. You won't. Yeah. That's an inside joke. Yeah, you may have to yeah. read the cliff notes on this episode. Yeah, you're gonna. So that story may come out eventually, but um, yeah, we have located cinnamon. <laughs> Mark it here first, folks. <laughs> oh man. So uh, in the news. In the news. A lot of uh, a lot of interesting things going on in our world uh, lately, and I know the topics come up in the shop here. Yeah, more than once. Yeah, I think we spent about two hours on it um, one day, and we spent another hour and a half on it yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna let's, I'm gonna preface this with this. This is merely our opinions, okay? I am not a um, cop. I am not a lawyer. I am not a forensic scientist. My extent of knowledge of crime and such ended at the Quincy ME box set and Law & Order SVU. Any original Law & Order, by the way. So, I, um, you know, don't take anything I'm saying right now as hard true fact. It's, this is just a matter of opinions and speculating. And we did a lot of that in the shop. Yes. And I do want to give it the respect that it deserves. So I'm not, you know, we're not making light of this. I want people to understand we're not talking about this to make lighter and make jokes about it like we would normally do on a topic because this is a serious thing. But, you know, it's in the news and a lot of people are speculating. It's real, real curious. So we just want to talk about it for a little bit. And, and if I may, for just a second, realistically, too, you know, we, we created the show to to show people what we do as cigar smokers. And like Scott said, this has been a topic of, of heavy discussion in the lounge. Not, and and I, can, I think you'd agree with me, you know, Larry wasn't here, but I think you'd agree with me. There was no joking when we were, the, both days. It was all serious discussion. No, absolutely. So, you know, um, anyway, and uh, the topic is, well, the, uh, top, the topic is ahead. the the short short version is the topic is the uh, young lady that's missing in the Grand Teton National Park and the very odd behavior of her fiance. 
So it, it's just, it, from me, you know, this, I was actually the one that brought this topic up in the shop because the case had caught my attention. Um, you know, social media has blown up over this. Uh, you've got sites that are not even normally covering news. You know, some of my hunting sites and my, my backpacking and hiking sites are covering this story because it's that, that big. Um, the, the young lady, I believe her name is Gabby, has Gabby been Petito. missing now for quite a while. Um, we're pushing past two weeks. Um, um, we're in three weeks. Well, no, two, two, two and a half weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so th the timeline is very strange. There was some new evidence that we brought out. Um, actually, let me take that word back. It's not evidence. It's not even fact because the, the site that I saw this on is not a major media organization, nor is it law enforcement. Um, you know, if you're all familiar with Western region of the United States like we are, there was a text message. The last known communication was from, from Gabby, was from a text message that says, no service in Yosemite. I think we need to back up a little bit here because I think we're hopping all over the place. I think we need to get to the beginning of it, to the beginning of the timeline, to get an idea of what's going on. I yield to the host on the right. Yeah, Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry, um, young couple, um, they are, you know, planning on getting married and they were traveling, um, you know, traveling west to um, see some sites and put it onto YouTube and Instagram and whatnot. And if you look at the timeline, it looks like, you know, typical YouTubers enjoying themselves, having a good time. And somehow it goes south on August 12th, where there was an incident in, um, what is it, Ac um, Arches National Park in Moab, Utah. Moab. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was in Moab, Utah where there was an argument that took place. Some bystanders um, had some concerns and contacted the um, Moab Police Department and they stopped their vehicle. And, you know, I saw the body cam footage because uh, Moab released the body cam footage. She was crying and upset and, you know, just kind of, I guess, a little freaked out. This is my opinion, you know, and the officer took her out of the car and was speaking to her. Her fiance, Brian, had scratches on his face. Um, he had been, let's just be honest, he had been assaulted by her, and that's by her own admission and his admission, but the cops looked upon it as a mental health crisis versus a domestic dispute. So nobody went to jail, and I believe the officers just suggested that they spend the night away from each other. So took them over to a, a motel. I think this is where the point where he hitched a ride back to the van because he was at the um, hotel. I don't know if that's fact or they. That's yeah. supposition. Yeah, that's supposition. <coughs> and next thing you know, they assume you know you assume they continued on their trip. Now she normally contacted her parents every couple of days. But there's this huge, gigantic gap where she hadn't contacted them. At the same time, the fiancé drives from Grand Teton. Somewhere. Somewhere in Grand Teton, all the way back to North Point, Florida, in her vehicle. Mind you, the, the van was her vehicle to the place where they were living, his parents' house, without Gabby. And on September 11th, her um, Gabby's parents contacted law enforcement to file a missing persons report. They go to talk to the fiance, and he lawyers up. His lawyer comes out with a canned statement. He's not giving any um, any um, answers to questions, and I, I don't I don't remember what else it was, but basically he lawyered up. So it's real curious, and we've been speculating. Okay, what could have happened? You know, I think a lot of us were. Um, fearing the worst and this, like I said this is our opinion I don't know you know whether you know based off of what we've seen in the media is all we have to go off of right so can I jump back to that message for a minute because we're at that point yes so there's a text message that says no service in Yosemite that was sent on the 30th again this is not a major media outlet this is and it's not law enforcement it's um it's one of the hiking Facebook pages which again I said earlier was unusual that they're covering this right um, two days later from the 30th on the first, 
he, the, the gentleman in question, Brandon or Brian, is back in, in Florida. It's just very odd. And, and you know, everybody, include the entire world, at least this country, is speculating. But we're not going to know anything until we actually hear from, from the other party, who I now understand as of the news this morning is missing. And here's, well. here's the thing, yeah. dude. Get in front of this. No, there, 53 years walking this planet for me, I have never met a woman that is going to walk away from her property, not leave with her purse, with a, with, right. with, a, with a change of undies, something. This does not look good for you. Regardless of what happened, how it happened, you need to get in front of this. Driving from Wyoming to Florida in that woman's vehicle to hide in the master bathroom of your mom and dad's house does not make a paint a pretty picture for you. Here's, regardless. Oh, I'm sorry, but I was going to say weird thing. I know you were saying it was supposition because it came up a couple of sites. This is actually out of globalnews.ca. The last text message that you spoke about, no... Um, no service in Yosemite, that was August 30th. That was yeah. the last text message. And Landry winds up in Florida on September 1st. And that's, that was another speculation that we were talking about that was just, again, it's an oddity. Can you drive that far in 48 hours? Sure. But you're, you know, you're, you're mainlining it. You got, the, you got the pedal of the floor. You're stopping for gas and taking a leak. That's it. Well, I'm thinking. And at this point, where is she, dude? Yeah. Nobody in their right mind, I don't care if you're 23, 43, 103, nobody in their right mind leaves a 22-year-old woman on the side of the road. I don't give a shit what kind of argument you had. Right. You know? Or at least saying something. Yeah, it, it, it's something. You know, if it went bad, it went bad. Tell, tell people it went bad. You know, that, that, that girl's family deserves to know what happened. Absolutely. You know? Mm -hmm. And... You're, you're, not, you're not creating a better situation for yourself, for your family, for anyone else involved, you know, by not, uh, by not cooperating with the law enforcement. That's just, that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And if you think, you know, you're staying out of the way to let them do their job, that's not the case. You know, you, they have to have information from you to be able to bring this to a conclusion, good, bad, or indifferent. So... Yeah, speaking of which, you know, there were protesters in front of um, his parents' residence where he was living and the new development. Did we mention it that now Brian Landry's missing? The family's filed a police report because he has not been seen since Tuesday of um, this past week. So now he's missing. So the big giant question mark is now where is he? We could speculate on that. I hesitate to. And yeah, I'm, I don't want to speculate until I don't, we know yeah, more. I don't want to, I, like I said, I want to give this the seriousness that it deserves. So I don't want to speculate about um, Gabby. I mean, let your conscience and your knowledge be your guide. I don't need to say it. Um, as far as Brian goes, I have my opinion on that one too. But I don't, you know, I don't know if I really want to put that out in the universe. No. But I, you know, I've seen enough in the world after 52 years. Um, I, I'm thinking, uh, I'm suspecting how I know this is going to go. Things tend to go certain ways. Right. Yeah. And, you know, hey, you guys out there, you know, I'm pretty sure that you're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking. I can just leave it at that. I'm not putting it out. I'm not going to be the one to put it out in the universe. And, no. you know, if, if people that know anything, they need to come forward because... Yeah. Yeah, if you've seen something... Both the you, parks you, are huge. If you got, if you, you know, even if you don't think it's rele relevant, you know, that's law enforcement's job. That's what they do is figure out, you know, was this, in, is this part of this case? Is this important? Is this relevant? If you got any information at all that, that you think might be helpful to find this girl, you know, to help this family... Please reach out to your local law enforcement. You know, um, we're we're our hopes and prayers that this is going to come out. You know, with a with a, a positive ending. Uh, but yeah, you know, please, if if you saw something, uh, if you heard something, talk to a cop. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's simply it's, it's, it's a few minutes out of your day, and it could it could do you know could do wonders for, you know, how 
how this case plays out. So. Yeah, I'll just say this. Um, if this all turns out to, like you say, a happy ending, I would be, so, this is one of those cases I'd be really happy to be fucking wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I for mean, sure. Hey, I, you can give me crap about me being wrong and I'll take it happily and say, yep. And yeah, we can all move on. It's just, I, I mean, I really love to see a happy, happy ending, but I just don't know the way these things go. You know, yeah. It, it's just nuts. You know, now, off the serious note, yeah. Larry mentioned something at breakfast today uh -oh. that was very interesting. Okay, do tell. And it's this TikTok thing. Yes, uh, I was just about to get into that. Go for it. Talk to me. So, I've got a part-time employee that's a high school student. And when she came in yesterday, she was talking about how there are basically no soap dispensers in any of the bathrooms at her high school. And I said, what? And uh, she brought up this TikTok thing, and I'd heard a little bit about it on uh, uh, Yahoo News. And apparently, kids are going around and figure there's a, some kind of TikTok challenge, whatever the hell that is, I'm too old for this crap. Uh, I don't know either, so. Of the largest ticket item you can steal or destroy or whatever without getting caught. So here's where we're at in our society, ladies and gentlemen. We've, had, we've gone so far down this road now where nobody's, kids aren't allowed to be forced to take responsibility for their actions. We've got an entire generation full of people that have never been punched in the mouth and I was waiting for you to get there. Yes. If your 14-year-old gets caught doing destruction, damage, theft of school property, there needs to be some consequences for that. That child needs to be charged, prosecuted, and pay the penalties for that. Yeah, if just, that means time in juvenile hall, yeah. that means time in juvenile hall. That means if you as a parent get a bill from the school district, that's what that means. That's your responsibility that that kid is doing things like that, doesn't realize that tearing a soap, you know, $300 soap dispenser or paper towel dispenser off a wall of bathroom is a crime. It's absolutely a crime. And the fact that you didn't beat his ass when he was five doing something stupid, and then again at 10 doing something stupid, now he's 14 or 15, and they don't think there's any consequences. Right. Well, I got two different takes on this whole situation. Um, social media, and I've said this before on the show, it tends to make a, it raises a generation of freaking cowards. You get to say what you want on social media with no repercussions versus saying it to someone's face and taking the risk of getting punched in the face or something happening to you or getting a retort kicked back at you. You can do it from your keyboard and there's no immediate repercussions. You did it. Ha ha. We, we see it all the time. We see adults doing this shit. Yeah. And for the most part, there, there's no malice or, or damage, you know, yeah. but there's also no filter to it. Right. So when you've never been, when you've never been disciplined for anything, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you don't have the requisite understanding that, hey, this may be a problem. Right. But then the second part of this take, let's think about this TikTok challenge for a second. Let's just break it down and I'll see if you two get it. Here's your TikTok challenge and I'm just repeating it back. The most expensive thing you can steal or destroy without getting caught. Why the hell are you doing it in the first place? No, that's not it. Keep going. I want you to think this out. I'm gonna get, this is pop quiz time. This, just how asinine this is. A TikTok challenge. Okay. What are you doing for the... How do you prove that you've done this? You can self-incriminate yourself because you got video of it. You've just produced how many millions of witnesses to your crime? Uh -huh. Yeah. Did anyone yeah, it's, it's think a, about it's this? A little hard. Wouldn't to, think about it's it. A little it that hard way, to yeah. deny it at that point. Right. 
So you're gonna get caught by default because you just produce. You don't even. You're not, it's not even incriminating yourself. You're documenting your own freaking crime and producing witnesses. So how does this work? Who came up with this idiotic shit? <laughs> like it's just. It's like kids think, and this is what I'm saying. Social media produces idiots. And you know, back in the late '90s. I mean, I'm going to give credit where credit is due to this. Um, there was a talk show um, host by the name of Mike Savage. He did the Savage Nation. It was syndicated, and he was real, real big, ultra-conservative talk show host. And he spoke on this whole idea of social media and people trying to be their own reality show. You know, you've got the mainstream reality shows on TV, the Kardashian, I mean, anything you want. I mean, just Kardashians, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And now you've got a, you know, it goes, it even spans beyond, you know, the, you know, this generation, you know, this young generation now. It's even adults and, you know, people trying to, you know, make themselves out doing insane, crazy crap. Not everybody can be jackass. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and let me ask, your life's been colorful. <laughs> so... I'm sure when you were in high school, pranks were played and oh, happened, yeah. but nothing was terribly malicious or meant to be destructive. I, I, I wouldn't say that. Okay. Um, but, but here's the difference. I graduated from high school in 1986. I'm 53 years old. We had a different society back then. I, you know, the older I get, the more I sound like my father. You know, when I was your age, God damn it. But, <laughs> But, but you don't have a cup of coffee in a Pall Mall either. But, but, but here's the difference. There was a clear set of rules in my household. There was a clear set of consequences if you broke those rules. It was, it was understood. There was, no, there was no gray area with, with my parents. And I would look at what I thought I might want to do that was, you know, a little questionable on my pop set of rules. And now I had a, a conscious decision to make as a 15, 16 year old, whatever, to either do that or not do that. And sometimes I'd do it. Sometimes you'd get caught, sometimes you wouldn't. Here's the difference. If I got caught doing something I wasn't supposed to have done, A, I stood up for it. I didn't, I didn't lie about it. My dad had asked me, did you do that? Yep. Why? Thought it was a good idea at the time. You understand you're going to get your ass busted for that, right? Yes, I do. That's the difference. I didn't lie about it. I didn't try to blame it on somebody else. I didn't, I didn't look for a way to weasel my way out of it. That was the difference back then. My friends, and we were all like that. You know, we got in trouble. I snuck out. My, my parents were separated for about a year and a half while I was in high school, and they got back together. I lived with my mom. I worked for my dad. wasn't a great option. I got to be the de facto answer man for both my parents. I get to the shop after school and my dad, hey, what kind of mood was your mother in? I get home from work, how's your dad today? I finally, I, get, I got, you know what, there's a phone on the wall, why don't you call him and ask him? And well, that didn't go over real well. Mm -hmm. no. So I get home uh, uh, one Thursday after football practice and I tell my mom Friday after the game, we had a home game, I'm going to this person's house, you know, where people are coming over. We're going to, I was going to stay the night. My mom's like, no, I don't want you doing that. I'm like, why not? She goes, no matter why, I want you home tonight. Because I said so. Yeah, well, and, you know, there was a set, there was a set of things going on that yeah. I didn't know about that she didn't have to, you know, right. she didn't have time or feel it was necessary to tell me about that point. Exactly. Well, I didn't care. I was pissed off. We, I had plans. We were going to, you know, my buddy's parents were out of town. We were bringing people over. They had a new hot tub. We had a plan. So I go, I go to school, and I was going half day. I go down the shop in the afternoon and come back for football. So I'm getting ready to leave the shop. I tell my pop, I said, hey, uh, after the game uh, tonight, I don't think we're going to the dance, uh, but I'm going to stay the night at so-and-so's house. Okay. He says, okay. I'm golden, right? Oh, no. Oh, uh, hey, hold on. It gets better. I'm so, listening. Uh, so football game. Go to my buddy's house. 
1.30 in the morning, the, uh, the phone's ringing at my buddy's house. And I should have prefaced this with the fact that the house that I was at, the, uh, the father was the chief of police in the town that we lived and went to high school. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So my parents had gone out to dinner that night. My dad brings my mom back to the house. My truck's not there. My mom's pissed because my mom had told me you're not to stay out tonight. My dad, oh no, he's staying over at so-and-so's house. <laughs> so now my dad is completely under the bus, run completely over. My mom blows a gasket. I told him. So now they're trying to find me. Well, in the 80s, chief of police's home phone number is not regularly published. So now my parents are calling parents of other buddies of mine, waking people up at 1 o'clock, 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, want to know where the half, the half their kid is. So finally, they get a phone number. They call the gymnos house. Vince comes downstairs with a cordless phone. I'm on the th I'm sleeping on the floor in the living room. He wakes me and goes, man, your dad is on the phone and he ain't happy. I take the phone and my old man is losing his shit. Where in the hell are you? I'm at Vince's house. No shit, asshole. It took me an hour and a half to get a phone number. Like, yeah, it was chief of police. I know who he is. I'm like, okay. I'm coming to get you. My truck's out front. No matter. I'm coming to get you. How do I get there? Okay, I know how to get to Vince's house, the 37 turns. I don't know the name of all the streets. My dad is getting madder by the second. Just a minute, Vince. I'm holding the phone out, Vince. You gotta tell my dad how to get here, Vince. Like, I don't wanna talk to your dad. I said, Vince, you don't tell my old man how to get here, street by street. When he gets here, on his own, he's gonna burn this fucking house down. Do you understand? <laughs> So Vince gets my dad there. My old man pulls up in a Buick. Quarter after two in the morning, Paul Mall in one hand, porcelain coffee cup in the other, usual MO. I get in the car. He don't say a word. I don't say a word. We're driving home. It's about 20 minutes to my mom's house. It's 2.25 2 in the morning. We are going down El Camino Real in Carlsbad, which is three lanes, divided highway both directions. Okay. My old man looks over at me and goes, what in the hell were you thinking? And like a moron, I start to explain what I was thinking. Ugh. My dad stops the car, cold ass stop, shifts it into park in the center lane of El Camino Real, 2.30 in the morning. He goes, let me explain something to you. Because I'm telling my dad, well, I didn't think, you know, because of this, because of that. He <laughs> says, uh, let me explain something to you. As long as you live under your mother's roof, you follow your mother's directions. You may not think your mother is always right, but as long as you live under her roof, she is never wrong. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Shift the thing back into drive and away we go. That's the difference. I know that's a long story to get to that point, but that's the difference. But that's how it worked. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I... You, my dad was ultimately clear. You have disrespected your mother with something that she told you in her own home. Doesn't matter what her reason was for telling you no. Doesn't matter what your reason was for thinking that that no was inappropriate. You asked a question. You asked permission to do something. You were told no. It fucking stops right there. Right. There was no more discussion after that. The fact that you did an end run and threw me under the, that's what it was, that's where he was pissed. Right. Because the whole premise of this is my folks were working out getting back together. So my dad's logic to this is I fucked this whole thing up for him. They went to dinner at a piano bar, had a great time, come home, my happy ass isn't there, my mom blows a fucking gasket and ruins my dad's whole program. <laughs> and this is all my okay. fault. 
and we all know what that program was. Oh yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> you know, you know, Larry's sure. gonna get a little brother. So, <laughs> so, so when you, you know, look, well, Larry, when you look at it that way, you saved yourself from a little brother. Yeah, yeah. No, dude, dude, my pops was sixty some years old. That wasn't happening. But uh, so, but here's here's the thing. So this is pre-cell phone, all this bullshit, right? This yeah, is yeah. Not, this is 1985 right. when this happened. I'm not allowed to use the phone. I'm not allowed to leave the house that weekend. Oh, yeah. It was 70-30 with my friends that I was even going to show up for school on Monday. I come rolling into my first period class, and two of the guys that were at this house party were in my first period math class, and they're like, Fuck, dude, we weren't sure we were going to see you or not. You're, nobody nobody come out outside. My pop pulls up. I walk out in the front yard. Everybody in the house is up. There's 35 people in the house. Every light's on. Everybody in the house. Nobody would even get close to a front window. They didn't want to get hit with a random blast of gunfire from my <laughs> old man. And, you know, most of these guys have known me since, you know, third, fourth grade. Yeah. And they're like, dude. We never seen your pop, though. You've know, never seen no shit like this happen. We weren't sure you were coming back. You know, you may have just been a statistic at that point. So, <laughs> well, you but, fucked up his night. What do you think well, was going to happen but, to you? But, you know, the, 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 long, the long road to Grandma's house on this is, is this is the explanation of why it's different today than it was then. There's, there was a clear set of rules, clear set of punishments. And when I screwed the pooch on these rules, I knew what to expect. That it, it wasn't, there wasn't going to be a discussion between father and son. Oh, no. You know, hey, this, the, you, this is, no, you did this, your ass is busted, or you're not, you know, you, you're yep. losing your truck for a week. You know, that, whatever the consequences were going to be, were going to be. There was no, we're going to sit down and, you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya and talk about oh, this shit. Oh, hell no. My pops was way past that bullshit. You know, it was, you know... The great equalizer was hearing that belt leave those, uh, you know, leave those uh, Levi's action slacks, you know, <laughs> because that my pop wore uniform pants and flourish and brogues every day of my life, and work, play. He mowed the yard in a shitty pair of flourish and brogues. He went to <laughs> dinner in a nice pair. That that was his thing, but. And, and but that's uh, the way it was though, honest, back then. Honest, we grew God, up the I same, think it, I think you know, it was same easier. era. I think it was easier for us to be kids. Yeah, it was. Because, you know, my parents weren't my friend. My dad my dad gave two fights. He'd tell me straight to my face, you fuck that up like that one more time, I'm going to kill you and make another one look just like you. That's pretty <laughs> you much know, how it worked. I'm eight years old. I'm like, what the hell? You know, <laughs> this is the same man who, who would tell people, because I've been able to talk like this all my life, because I, I didn't grow up around other kids. You know, my dad was 47 when I was born. My right. mom was 39. You know, their friends, their kids were teenagers when I was little. You know, it was just a different age bracket, yeah. a different thing. I remember the first time, I was probably eight years old. First time I heard my dad tell somebody, see, that guy, see that's my kid right there. He'd, talk, he'd sell you anything, talk, talk to you about anything. He can go from an in devil ACP meeting right across the hall to a Ku Klux Klan meeting and, <laughs> and, just, hey, and just change hats. I was horrified. That was the most racist shit I'd ever heard in my life. Like, what the fuck is my dad saying? And it took me a while, probably a couple of years, I had to hear this three or four more times to figure out what he meant. You know, he meant I could, I could talk to anybody about anything. Right. But at eight years old, that's not what I heard. You know, I'm like, ah, ah, daddy thinks I'm a racist. You know, I'm like, what, what the hell is going on? I can see you in a little white sheet in the hood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was it was Southern California. It'd have been board shorts and a hood. But, That's true. Um, <laughs> Greg, you okay? Breathe, yeah, breathe, come brother. On, man. Breathe. But it's just don't do that to me, man. When I got a mouthful of coffee, <laughs> it's just you know it, things are just different. You know, and my son, my oldest son, sitting over here, he's our camera monkey, and I think he'll tell you. <laughs> From the time he started high school till the time his younger brother graduated high school, I had a boy. I had a son at Del Oro for nine years. We we were nine years on that campus. Yeah. And if I had a dollar 
for every time somebody told me, you're awfully hard on those boys. Excuse me? I'm not trying to... I, I, these aren't my friends. These are my right. children. Exactly. You know, and I am, I by no means will sit here and tell people that I did everything right as a parent because I did not. Yeah, you and you me know, both, brother. You know, I screwed the pooch uh, probably more times than I am comfortable talking about for any one of my three boys. But I did the best I could with the information I had, and I think that I ended up with three pretty good boys. I had a guy ask me about two months ago, how your son's doing? I said, well, all three of them are gainfully employed. They're all supporting themselves. They pay their own bills. A couple of them not necessarily market value just because of the situation currently. Yeah. You know, got one one in a granny flat at, on the ha at the house, one in a uh, you know, converted garage, but they pay their own way. They pay their own insurance, their own yep. gas. Um, they're all gainfully employed and or continuing their education. Mm -hmm. Nobody's hooked on dope. Nobody's been locked up and nobody's got anybody pregnant out of wedlock. Yeah. Based on today's standards, I feel that their mother and I have done all right. You know, the greatest reward I got as a father, when I picked up my little girl when she came back from London, and I was talking, you know, my oldest, and, you know, we were just talking on the way home, and she told me, she said, Daddy, she says, you know, you did a lot of stuff when we were smaller that... Ah, uh, yeah. It's basically, you know, some of the things I hated you for. But when, you know, looking back now, I appreciate all those things you did for me that made me learn, you know, how to be an adult, you know, how to how to be, man. Yep. Because some of my lessons were a little harsh, but it was just kind of like I had to keep telling myself, she is, you know, baby girl, she's not my friend. I'm not trying to be her pal. I mean, I'm her daddy. And it's like, I'd rather you learn a harsh lesson from me where I can keep an eye on you, make sure, you know, you may think it's something horrible, but I've been, always been keeping an eye on it to make sure you don't go way, way off the deep end. I'll be there to, you know, keep you off the deep end rather than you go out into the world and do something where, you know, there's nobody looking out for you and yeah. you're just stuck. But I, I think, I think this is where, this is another part where, as you two have said, their parents, not friends. There is time to be friends with your child when they're grown, not when they're being raised. Well, yeah. yeah, and it's, I mean, you it's more to, of a coach when you get older. You have mm -hmm. to be able to communicate with them. Yeah. But you also have to be, have to have enough intelligence, insight, and common sense to pay attention to what's going on, you know, on the daily. And that's, that's what's changed over the years is we've made life too hard on ourselves, especially here in California, man. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I look at my three sons and, you know, a couple years ago, three years ago, I had their mother talked into, you know, we need to look at maybe retiring out of state mm -hmm. when, it, when it's time, when, when she's able to retire, you know, we'll, I'll sell my business and we're going to have to move someplace that's a little more financially feasible for us to retire. Yeah. And she was on board with that <clears throat> until we found out that our daughter-in-law, our middle son's wife, was pregnant. And then my wife's whole attitude changed. Oh my God, I want to be here for those grandbabies. Oh, yeah. It took me six months after our grandson was born to finally get it through to her. I, and I finally, I said, sure, you understand that if we leave this state, these kids are going to end up following us because they can't afford to live here. We've created a situation in California where a working man can't buy a house in 80 to 90 percent of this state. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. care what living wage you're paying them. You know, when I moved out in 1987, there were six guys in a four bedroom house. We paid $875 a month for that house. Mm -hmm. Total? Total. Yeah. One bedroom apartment right now that our, my middle son was looking at 1700 bucks yeah. for a one bedroom apartment. How in the hell is a, you know, how many people are you gonna put in one bedroom? One, right? <laughs> how in the hell is a 26 year old, I don't give a shit where he's working. Right. How in the hell is, is a 20 some year old kid 
supposed to pay $1,700 a month for an apartment plus utilities. Right. You gotta have a phone. You, you gotta, gotta have car insurance. You gotta make three times what the rental price per month because they want to make sure you don't default up. You know, yeah, right. Yeah. So it's we've created a situation that's unsustainable. Yeah. But we we are not putting as a society we're not putting any remedies in place to to help rectify that. You know, I I've got guy people tell me all the time. Oh, I got you know I got two kids. I got one of them still living at home. This and that. You can't look at that as a negative. Right. We've created that. You know, the, the guys that are in their 40s and 50s, we've created that. We've made it so hard that just to meet the minimum requirement, to not be living below the poverty line, you and your significant other have to have two really goddamn good jobs. Yeah. And you're putting in a lot of hours, a lot of time, and... Things are going to get missed, folks. This TikTok shit is going to come up, and you're going to have a 14-year-old tearing a goddamn soap dispenser off a wall at his high school. Because, because there's not the time to get in front of that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is getting a little heavier with both these topics than we normally do on the program, but there's, you know... This is weighed on, I think, all of us a yeah. lot as stuff's coming up. You know, I, by nature, as animals walking this planet, and I think Chris, as is is an older father sitting here in the, in the background, will agree with me on this. By nature, as animals, we want our offspring to have an easier time <coughs> than we did. And they I don't. Know, uh, but, and, but I know my parents they did. Don't. You know, my dad grew up through the Depression was a World War II vet. He, you know, he had a hard life and I didn't realize, <coughs> excuse me, how hard it was till close to the end of his life. You know, because as, as a kid, you just don't put the, you don't get the, the emphasis of some of the stories you're hearing. Yeah. But as, as, a, as a teenager, young 20s, you know, when my dad was coming near the end, it became clear that some of the, some of the struggles that he had and then as I think back of some of the things that he did and how he did it, and my son's sitting here, and I think he'll, if he thought about it for a while, he'll attest to the fact that he can remember, you know, as he was younger, you know, I always get up and go to work. That's all I know how to do. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a college graduate. I did some college classes. I did, but that was never my mindset. My mindset was always about work from the time mm -hmm. I was, you know, junior high age. I started... I started my first business when I was 14 years old with a buddy of mine who was 16. I've had five different businesses over my life. I've worked for small companies. I've worked for multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been all over the place. But I think that if you asked any one of my three sons, they will have memories throughout their younger years that dad was at work. And I worked, when, when Anthony was little, I worked, two, I worked a graveyard job that I could put 25 or 30 hours a week overtime in. They, they would allow that. I'd work it because it was easier to be up seven nights a week than it was trying to downshift back to a regular schedule. I worked that job for eight and a half years. Eight of those eight and a half years, I did something else almost full time during the day. I poured concrete for four years with a buddy of mine, and then I ran a side business for four years until I sold it off because it was important to to me and to, to Sherry and I as a family that somebody else didn't raise our kids when they were little. You know, it gave her the opportunity to be at home. She still worked a little bit part-time. And then when our youngest was born, she was, uh, she was back to work full-time and we were able to, to split, you know, some of that time. And I'd be home in the morning with the boys, but that was our personal choice as a family to, Make sure that we had a roof over our head, groceries in the fridge, oh, yeah. and you know the rest of the bills were paid. And it's harder now for young families to do that. Well, yeah, in my case, when I started working for Corporate America and had my, I won't say first real job, but you know something that was making some significant pay, I did the sacrifice um, at the time we were um, living with... Um, my mother-in-law in Oakland, and I didn't want my kids to go to school in Oakland, so uh, we moved out to Sacramento because at that time, 
housing prices were dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. So I made the sacrifice. I was like, well, and my office was in San Jose for two years, man. I drove from South Sac <laughs> to San Jose five, six days a week. Yep. And, you know, I was hardly home. Yep. You know, and that's what you just what, you know, I had to do. And that's, so, you know, and it's. And like you say, stuff gets missed. I missed a, a you know chunk of my kid's life because I was doing that because I would rather do that versus you know living where we were living and you know just to be on our own in our own house. Yep. You know th those are the th sacrifices you got to do. And that's the things that you worry about uh, occasionally as a parent. You know, does does this make sense to my kids? Yeah. You know, because uh, I've I've heard it. You know, I've heard different things from different ones of them at different times. Well, what, I, you know, because of this, I felt this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's hard to explain something to an 8-year-old. It's yeah. a little easier to explain something to an 8-year-old, uh, 18-year-old. Right. You know, it's like, hey, man, this is what I had to do at that time, you know, so that we could, you know, we could do the things that, you know, that we wanted and needed to do as a True. family. And for the most part, they get it, you know, but it's... It's work, man, day in and day out. Whether you're getting up, going to that job, or you're, you know, taking them to, to football or to, to little league or to cheer or to oh, whatever yeah. you're doing, you know, it's just it's work. Yeah. And uh, we've made it exponentially harder throughout time. And if we don't sit down as as a society and look at that, and and start, you know, treating some of these situations a little bit different. You know, this, all this social media bullshit and all this other stuff, it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's the truth, man. And, uh, you know, just, you know, make sure you're talking to your kids. Make sure, you know, that they, you know, it's important that they know some of the struggles that you have as an adult, too. You know, because if you think you're doing them a favor, hiding shit, you know, if, if, if it's a hard time right now, explain to them it's a hard time. They need to understand that. The sooner that that a kid realizes a life sucks b you need to learn some skills to navigate a few of these potholes so it doesn't suck as bad c you'll have a better experience those are my th those are my three right hey man there. well said well said yeah we need to kind of wrap this up we're going long today because we got so, kind of crazy we did but um scott final thoughts on your cigar um very nice cigar. I've got a box of them. I'm happy with said box. I would buy another box. So I would call this box worthy. Yeah. Uh, same, hey, same here. Uh, Davidoff, excellent brand. Um, very happy with their signature series. Uh, great go-to cigar in the morning. Uh, if you haven't tried one, uh, swing by your local brick and mortar and, uh, and pick one up. Uh, price point's a little heavier than, uh, than I normally do, but... Uh, uh, well worth it for you know an occasional uh, stray from your usual. Yeah. Okay. Side note, we've got to get Vivaldi Spring on the board when we discuss Davidoff. Yes, we do. How many, we yeah, do. we did. I didn't realize you were going to do a Davidoff because yeah, we could have prepared for that because the rule is if we do Davidoff, you know, we have to have some stuffy music behind it. Yes. And Greg, what about your final thoughts, my friend? So, so this Perla Del Mar. Um, it, this is the second one I've smoked. Um, smoked one last night, and ideally for what we were talking about today, the morning cigar. This was a great morning cigar. It the flavor was great on the cigar. It didn't overpower the coffee. So it, all in all, you know that for a morning cigar, or in that fact, an evening cigar, it was beautiful. Um, before we go, I want to give a shout out to somebody. Um, you know. A lot of us don't find ourselves traveling through Idaho all that often. I do, because I have friends that live up there. Um, do you have other friends? Not many, but yes. <laughs> so, Sorry, man. <laughs> hey, when you guys are up in Idaho, uh, you might think that that is a not cigar rich area. I wanted to disavow disavow you of that opinion. Um, there is a shop in Meridian. It's called The Vault. It's run by a friend of mine, Josh Everett. It is a great shop. It's on our list to visit. In fact, he wants to be on the podcast. Um, so when you guys find yourself up in the Boise area, take the 20 minute drive, go into the Meridian, go into the vault. I'd say tell Josh you know me, but that could be a problem for you. But you know, he is a listener of the podcast and a supporter of the cartel. 
and uh, I support him every chance I get to go up there. It's a great shop. Check them out. See what they're like. Um, he just redid the shop. He's got a full bar and a full-time bartender there during opening hours. And now that it's football season, both college and NFL, he's staying open late. And, and uh, after the, when the games are on, he's got the games on the two TVs. It's a really awesome place to visit. So get up there and check them out. We'll be up there on a live broadcast hopefully soon. I'll reach out to him and see what his calendar looks like before the snow gets too bad. Sounds good. Good deal. Oh, another thing. I know last episode we promised you Brian from Illusion. Unfortunately, due to some issues on his end and some illness on our end, um, we had to reschedule that interview. So don't think we forgot. We just have to reschedule it. Well, how we ended always looks like the um, cigars down to the nub and the scotch glass is empty. So I think it's about that time. I want to thank our audience out there, and on behalf of Larry and Greg, I just want to tell you guys thank you for listening. Check us out at LewisCigarCartel.com, um, like and share us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and don't be a stranger. Drop a line, let us know you're out there. I'm Scott Robinson, and again, on behalf of all of us here at Beyond the Humidor, I want to thank you for listening and look forward to um, having you join us in the next show. And until then, as I always say, good smoke good drink, and good life. Clear. Thank you for the golf clap.